What is going on, everybody? This is Patty XRP with the DeFi Standard, and we are going to dive into some conversation about the risks of DeFi today. And we will be pulling a lot of this information from the World Economic Forum Policymaker Toolkit on DeFi. And, you know, I personally believe this is a very important video for anybody that's new to DeFi or financial products in general. Um, to understand what kind of risks are out there, what kind of pitfalls and roadblocks you could run into. And, you know, it's all about awareness. If you're aware when you're entering into some kind of transaction, trade, position uh, of what could possibly happen to you, at least you can plan for worst case scenarios and, you know, maybe hedge that risk as well. And so without further ado, we will go ahead and hop in to this document here and they have five different categories listed out we'll kind of go through what each of those are and then talk about associated risks with them as well as some case studies under each category that have been provided by this document so the first one is going to be financial risk which is the depletion of funds due to the transactional behavior of fellow users concerning the digital assets in the DeFi service you know a real quick example is markets move up and down uh, you know, your funds could be decreased in value as far as the U.S. dollar goes if, you know, one of your assets starts selling off heavily. And moving on to the next one, we have technical, which is going to be failures of the software systems supporting transaction execution, pricing, and integrity. You know, this kind of really comes into, you know, who is the team creating this product? Uh, and then, you know, have they had the proper independent security audits done? Have they had the proper stress testing? A lot of that can kind of help avoid these bugs. But, you know, we pretty much have very, very little control over this section other than how, you know, we're vetting our projects that we choose to put our money into. The next set is operation. So, this is saying failures of the human systems for key management protocol development or governance. Uh, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. If you lose your keys and then lock yourself out of a hardware wallet, you're kind of SOL. You're not getting those assets back. And then moving down would be legal compliance, use of DeFi to engage in illicit activity or to evade regulatory obligations. So, you know, a lot of us as XRP holders have most certainly faced uh, this category of risk with XRP. Um, you know, when I was investing in it, I definitely thought that we were past the stage where the SEC would drop a lawsuit. And, you know, I wasn't particularly prepared for that to come down or how harshly the market was going to react to it. So that was something I gauged poorly um, when that came about last December. But that is definitely, you know, bound to happen in DeFi. And, you know, this is also part of the vetting process. Is the project going to be using any KYC and AML structures? Uh, you know, will do they have a plan to deal with legal issues? Like Flare Finance has, you know, set aside capital reserves with, you know, some of their token distributions. Uh, for them to be used in any kind of legal issues they may have. And we know they're going the KYC AML route. So I feel like they're really prepping for, you know, some kind of knockback from the regulatory agencies around the world, um, at least in the larger jurisdictions where they're going to get most of their volume. So it's definitely something to look out for. And then the last section is going to be emergent risk. And these are macro scale crashes or undermining of the financial system due to the interaction, scaling, and integration of DeFi components. So, you know, while this is about composability, composability in DeFi um, and how that interacts with each other, you know, one really, you know, easy example to point out would be March 2020 during uh, the crash caused by the pandemic that occurred. And... We saw the stock market start selling off heavily at the end of February, and that in turn went into the crypto market, which sold off at a much greater rate than the stock market crash even did. Um, and, you know, that's from people being highly leveraged in the stock market. And, you know, we saw gold and silver dip at the time as well. And, you know, people think, well, why would that happen? You know, gold and silver is supposed to be a hedge. You know, when, when we have like, you know, something's a hedge. It's kind of sometimes more of a long term, you know, that it works out. But in the short term, there were so many people over leveraged that they had to start 
selling out of other assets so that they could pay off their margin calls in the stock market with their brokers. Uh, so all of these are really important. And honestly, emergent is probably uh, the most scary because it seems to come out of nowhere and when people least expect it. But let's kind of get into some of these lower classifications and explain further. Financial risks have three subgroupings, and that is market, counterparty, and liquidity risk. Like we were saying earlier, market risk is the volatility of assets moving up and down, and you know often that can be outside your control. So you know that's one that everybody's well aware of, and we don't have to talk as much about. Uh, additionally, you know there is still some counterparty risk in um, DeFi applications, and that can come from you know, loans needing to have a lot of collateral. If things start becoming under collateralized at a really great rate, uh, you could suffer in that area within, depending on how a loan system is set up in DeFi. And, you know, also some of the counterparty risk stuff is taken out in DeFi because smart contracts are automatically executing transactions. So you don't have to worry about some centralized exchange facilitating that and, um, you know, either them failing on their end or some event happening that causes that exchange to go under. You know, there's nothing that's going to make a smart contract go under in terms of, you know, finance. Now, you know, if you want to talk about technical stuff and there's an EMP or something like that, you know, be my guest, but that's, you know, kind of outside the scope of a financial risk. And then additionally, liquidation risk. So since also with the collateralization point, um, you know, some of these protocols will liquidate you extremely quickly if you fall below the required collateral ratio. And I've heard of many people that have been liquidated, whether it be on like Nexo or Kava or something like that. And at least with these DeFi services, you should be able to access them all the time. Some of these CFI providers, their service will shut down and you won't be able to get out of, you know, um, a liquidation scenario. Or if you need to source capital from an exchange, there may not be enough there, whether it be a DEX or a centralized one to bring it over and recollateralize your position in time. So one of the ways kind of to avoid that is to over collateralize to an amount where you could withstand the largest possible drop you would expect to happen. Or since that is not as capital efficient, um, I guess this isn't really either. You could always have some cash reserves on the side for, uh, you know, dire situations where you need to, you know, get more collateral in a very quick manner. Moving to technical risks, this kind of has to do with the functioning of the layer one blockchain with settlement. And the first subgrouping would be transaction risk, which is either, you know, if double spend occurs and the same amount, like same tokens being spent in two places at once, uh, you know, also it could be that transactions become too expensive and you're unable to perform a transaction that you need to do. You know, this could be on Ethereum. We've seen how high some of those gas fees get, you know, luckily on Flare Network, since they're utilizing federated Byzantine agreement with the Avalanche consensus protocol uh, to organize everything, you know, we're going to see lower gas fees because of that. They're going to be much lower and, um, you know, there's going to be some kind of cap, you know, through governance that, you know, allows the community to keep gas fees at a reasonable level. Uh, you know, when we are coming into blockchain and DeFi, it's kind of to get away from obscene fees like on exchanges uh, like Coinbase. Additionally, um, there are also smart contract risks. So this is going to deal with code that, uh, you know, isn't working as it's supposed to. So that could be either from some kind of flaw when whoever was designing that code uh, that happened, or it could also be a situation where there's some kind of brute force attack and there's not enough security around the network. Um, so there's different types of this and it definitely, you wanna see that there's some kind of independent security auditing being done on a DeFi service you're gonna use, maybe a bounty program, um, 
you know, or some kind of ongoing overview of risks that could pop up in the system. So like I know Flare Network, Hugo said they're going to have a bounty program to find bugs for white hat hackers. And then additionally, Flare Finance said they're hiring a dedicated team to monitor everything that's happening on the ecosystem for at least a month. And maybe it can be extended. So like in the beginning, at least they'll have somebody to sit there and watch or, you know, some algorithm that's doing it. And, you know, if certain criteria are hit, it can alert that there's some kind of, you know, issue going on and it could hopefully be fixed before any harm is done. And an interesting uh, case study here would be from the, it's called the Dow exploit. And honestly, I'm just going to read this whole thing verbatim from the uh, document because it explains how, you know, Ethereum Classic became a thing. So it said the DAO, a decentralized crowdfunding platform, was the first viable DeFi service in 2016. Approximately $150 million worth of Ether was locked in its smart contracts with the goal of funding decentralized application development. Before it launched, though, an attacker exploited a bug to drain approximately 40% of the funds into a child DAO. And to prevent permanent loss and the collapse of confidence in Ethereum, the miners agreed to implement a hard fork that reversed the theft on the main Ethereum chain. Uh, and then a minority faction continued mining the deprecated chain, which became known as Ethereum Classic. So that's very interesting. And, you know, this kind of happened before this this whole thing launched. <laughs> um, so, like, you know, they just hacked, hacked the code and... Um, we're able to drain a ton of money. So like, it's highly important that you have some kind of auditing firm looking after this stuff and preferably a, refu a reputable one. And then moving forward with more technical risks. So minor risk basically has to do with the ordering and execution of transactions. So miners can choose, choose to allow other, uh, you know, other entities to front run your trade so that they get a better price, or maybe they can take the other side and they could do this for cash under the table and things like that. There are no miners on the Flare network, so it's not as big of a deal with Flare, which is nice to know. And then also there's another one called Oracle Risk, and this involves the potential that external data is not accurate or, you know, in some way manipulated. So I know like some some DeFi services use coin market cap as their oracle for prices, which is centralized. And if you're an XRP holder, you know about all the funny business that has gone on with them in XRP in the past. So that's you know, not great, you know a DeFi system as is decentralized as its Oracle. And that's very important that the Flare time series Oracle, it's going to be built in on chain. And also we can see that there's going to be many different groups that are contributing to it. At least 15 signal providers that I have seen. I think it's more, I'm not even counting Flare limited at this point. And then you're also going to have, you know, this whole voter base of spark holders with their detachable vote that they can delegate to different signal providers and move it around, um, you know, in an instantaneous manner if, you know, a signal provider is not acting in the right light. So hopefully that will kind of reduce any um, Oracle risk, but it's also used as a tactic in what are called DeFi hacks, which is basically kind of like flooding pools and things like that. So different oracles operate in different ways. And um, we can touch on how Compound had an oracle exploit back in November of 2020. So the price of the DAI stablecoin was driven up 30% off its $1 peg. Not very stable. I mean, I wish I could get a 30% return on XRP right now, but you know, it's been tough. <laughs> and uh, so basically when the, the DAI price spiked, it caused um, the smart contracts on Compound to determine that a bunch of loans were under collateralized and it triggered a liquidation of assets upwards of $89 million automatically. So, you know, that kind of adds in some of the liquidation risks. So you can see how these interplay just like DeFi is composable. And, you know, they never really figured out what caused um, the Coinbase price of DAI to shoot up like that. But the fact that Compound was just using Coinbase as an oracle, I would say that leans more towards centralized. So, like, you could even say, is it a DeFi service at that point? 
Um, I just think it's very important, you know, to take the Oracle stuff into account because many DeFi hacks have been successfully done through some kind of manipulation of a price Oracle. Uh, so hopefully, you know, that'll give you at least gives me some extra confidence in Flare just because of how the FTSO is set up. And, uh, you know, we'll see what happens when we go live. But these are things that can happen. Our next category is going to be operational. And like we said earlier, uh, key management is a big one. So whether you're relying on some provider that's holding your keys for you or you're doing it yourself, there can be errors there and funds can be lost. So, you know, that's human error in a lot of those cases. Additionally, routine maintenance and upgrades can be an issue. I know when David Schwartz put out that proposal for the XRP Ledger Federated Sidechains, he added in a point that, you know, we're trying to do minimally invasive code updates, but obviously something that we do could change the behavior of the system overall. So, you know, those are always something to watch out for and could cause a um, blockchain to have some issues. Additionally, you're going to have um, problems with governance mechanisms. And this is why Mickey and I preach governance, because if not enough people are voting in governance to meet the minimum turnout uh, level, the blockchain may not be able to advance. And now your funds are stuck in a blockchain that can't upgrade and change with the times. So, you know, the way that governance is set up, you want to avoid centralization, but you also want it to be able to function in a way where, you know, enough people are voting and they're taking that ecosystem seriously. So one of the nice things I like about Flare in this regard, and obviously all these things, like they may not be perfect fixes, but, you know, it's just a take that the founders are having, um, you know, on how to organize this ecosystem. But through liquid democracy, individuals or parties are allowed to delegate their votes to somebody else. And then that person in turn could delegate it to another group and it could go up the chain. It could have as many, you know, separate delegations until a final vote is made. And hopefully this will... People that don't want to pay attention to all the minutiae going on as far as parameter changes, updates to the code, things like that. Hopefully they will be, um, you know, at least delegating their vote to somebody that they think represents their best interests in the ecosystem. Uh, so, you know, we can move things along with Flair. Moving to our next category, which is legal compliance and that's going to take the form in either financial crime. So that's where implementing KYC and AML like Flare Finance and Trustline can help a DeFi service, you know, avoid the bad eye of a regulator. And then additionally, there could be fraud or market manipulation. I mean, straight up fraud could be a DeFi rug pull, which, you know, that's one of the big things why you need security audits. You want to see that these are, you know, really known investors. So like Flare, we see like DCG is involved in it. Charlie Lee's involved in it. Ripple's involved in it. Um, Borderless Capital with Algorand is involved in it. Uh, Do Kwan from Terra. Like these are all names that have been around for a while and I think have some, um, you know, clout in the space that, you know, hopefully we can trust that Flare's not a scam. I, you know, I don't think it is in any way, but those are just kind of things that you can look to, to, you know, make a decision on that. You know, if you don't know anything that's going on around an ecosystem and far, as far as who's invested in it, who's involved, you know, that could be a red flag. It doesn't mean that it necessarily is, but it definitely could be. And then also you can have regulatory evasion. So that's kind of just like trying to skirt around the rules. And, you know, if you're unlucky enough to get caught by a regulator, they could look on you unfavorably. Um, I'm sure the SEC views Ripple as, you know, skirting around their rules, uh, you know, with technology. And that could be part of the reason they dropped the lawsuit. I'm sure there's a lot of other ones too, or didn't drop it, but, you know, dropped it on Ripple. <laughs> um, don't want to get anybody too excited there. But um, yeah, I mean, honestly, legal regulatory risk is my least favorite thing to talk about because, you know, the decisions are made so far away from us that we don't really have much of a say in how that is deployed on DeFi. And then moving into the last part, um, which is emergent risks, this is going to be dynamic interactions or flash crashes or price cascades. So earlier I was talking about um, in 2020, 2020, March, 
where we had the crypto crash, you know, stemming from the stock market crash. That is certainly something that could be considered a flash crash or price cascade. Um, but that's like even a bigger systemic risk. That's like our entire financial system and not just within blockchain or the DeFi ecosystem. Um, and since DeFi is extremely composable, um, that's kind of where that cascading risk comes into. If one protocol that, you know, may interact a little or, you know, have some interoperability with another, you know, suffers extreme issues, it could just kind of flood over into the next one. So being aware of that is very important and knowing how to get out like options to get out of, you know, some product you're using, whether it's a liquidity pool, a loan arrangement, um, an insurance protocol, it's always good to have an exit plan in that regard. You don't have to use it, but just in case some, you know, crazy situation occurs. And to go through one of the case studies listed on these emergent risks, they list one called MakerDAO's Black Thursday. And this is one of the largest systemic failures in a DeFi service that took place on Thursday, the 12th of March, 2020. So you can see kind of in that time frame where there's a lot of stuff going on in the world and the financial markets and, you know, it affected MakerDAO. So basically their liquidation system failed and $8 million in user assets were lost. And the problem was exacerbated by network congestion on the Ethereum blockchain, which increased gas prices for validating transactions and slowed the flow of data updates to the MakerDAO Oracle service. Um, so you can see how like the settlement layer, the blockchain underpinning MakerDAO, since there were so many people using it, trying to sell out of their funds uh, because of this like, you know, flash crash that essentially happened in the broader markets and the crypto market, it eventually slowed the blockchain enough to where the Oracle for MakerDAO stopped working and it caused, you know, issues with the DeFi service. So that's a, you know, a lot of different risks bundled into one. And that kind of goes into where composability um, is really great and it allows us to do a lot more with our money in faster ways and you know and oftentimes with less capital you can deploy it it also introduces new risks and you know cascading ones but um you know one of the biggest things i'd say with these emergent risks is flash loans and those basically happen because the ethereum blockchain allows you to take like multiple steps up to the gas limit um, within a single transaction. So you could move funds from one place to another to another, pull funds from somewhere else, all within the same block before it's recorded. And basically with flash loans, you have to repay the loan at the end of the block. Otherwise it rescinds and it's not record recorded on like the Ethereum blockchain. Um, so Flare doesn't operate like that, uh, different consensus structure. So that's at least one thing that we're not gonna have to worry about. Also, you know, I don't want to like scare anybody too much with this stuff, but one of the nice things is with the governance on Flare is that you have to vote a lot of projects on and they're not just going to be like randomly spun up all the time. Um, you know, if they have to do with if they're considered a spark dependent application, then there is a voting process that goes through to allow it onto the Flare network. So that can be a way for all of us kind of to look out as the ecosystem keeps evolving and keep some of these you know, DeFi services that could, you know, pose systemic risk to the rest of the Flare network. Um, maybe we want to keep those out, even though flash loans definitely have some good things you can do with them, you know, easy access to capital. Um, it's easy to get yourself out of a collateral position with those in the case that like, maybe you're going to be under collateralized and you're not going to have enough funds to re-collateralize. But, um, I think the risk just greatly outweigh the benefits with them. And uh, that's going to wrap it up for this show. Uh, hopefully you guys, you know, got something out of it. This is going to be an evolving conversation with us, especially as the network goes live and we can kind of see things more in action. I would love to, in the future, talk about some ways to hedge against this stuff. Um, it's just going to be a little more difficult in the early days of Flare and also DeFi. It just doesn't have enough derivative applications yet, uh, which are primarily used for hedging so that you can go, you know, long and short assets, uh, get payouts in different situations. But, you know, we'll have to see how that evolves. I'm really hoping that Hugo has something up his sleeve with derivatives. If not, you know, 
around launch, uh, maybe post, but that's kind of just me hoping right there. I don't really have any insider info on that one, you know, other than Hugo and his team are, you know, very clued in with derivatives. Hugo was like head of a uh, brokerage or prime trading desk, uh, at one of his old jobs. So I'm sure that they are very interested in that as well, just based on the past history. But anyways, um, I'm Patty XRP, and this is the DeFi standard, and I'll see you guys the next time.